Good afternoon, everyone. It is such a pleasure to see those of you who are here in person, in person, and those following on Hopin. Thank you for joining us. It's a real joy to be chairing this event because as a former human rights lawyer and a journalist, this is a cause very close to my heart. But these two incredible people are also literally close to me. I have been on the board of the Death Penalty Project for many years. I was just discussing with Saul and Pervez when we first met, we think it was about 16, maybe 17 years ago, I was a baby barrister and the first case I ever worked on was an extremely uh, eventful appeal <laughs> from Belize in the Privy Council that was one of your appeals. So just to tell you a bit more about Saul and Pavez, they are the founders of the Death Penalty Project. It's a really remarkable organization and that rare thing of lawyers who actually save lives. Um, it's based on the belief that the death penalties are cruel and unusual and inhuman punishment that discriminates against the poorest and most disadvantaged people in society. And what's so remarkable and special about the Death Penalty Project is that the work that it does is very real, tangible and measurable. Saul and Pervez and the amazing group of lawyers and um, administrators who work with them litigate on behalf of prisons on death row, currently in 30 countries in Africa and Asia and the Caribbean. They support vulnerable prisoners, including juveniles, those suffering from mental health issues and victims of domestic abuse and help them gain access to justice. They deliver targeted and practical training to judges, lawyers and mental health professionals and commission original research and engage decision makers to support informed and constructive debate, which as we all know is something that seems increasingly scarce in our world and more valuable than ever. So it's a real pleasure to be with you. Thank you as ever for the work that we do. And I'm really keen to get into what makes you tick and what you're what you're doing in, in your field. But first we're going to humanize this conversation by hearing from somebody whose life has actually been changed by appealing against the death penalty. So here is a video of Kwame Ajumu, a death row exoneree and chairman to a charity called Witness to Innocence, who's going to explain a bit about his personal experience of the death penalty. I am Kwame Kamau Ajamu, chairman of Witness to Innocence and a myself a uh, death row survivor. I got to death row. They were talking very foul to me, you know, very, very foul to, to me. And these were, these were grown men I was, you know, hit. Most, uh, most, uh, uh, I think mentally punishing uh, for me at that time, and I, it, I would assume it would have been for all of the guys prior to my coming, uh, was that uh, they would actually show me the, the, uh, the, the electric chair. They would actually showed it to me, took me to the little cell where it was at, and showed it to me and told me that it was something worse to the fact that uh, girl, it was going to be a hot date for me, you know, meet my new girl or some old bull crap like that, right? Um, but that stayed with me even now. The mere fact that you're sentenced to die, they put you in isolation. One day in isolation away from uh, another human brain or another human being, causes damage to the human psyche. The third day on death row, a man screamed for like eight hours. Nobody did nothing. Everybody else was used to it, you know, but this is my third day on death row, so I was screaming with him. I was screaming for somebody to come help him. November the 20th, 2014, uh, my wife's brakes needed changing. So I was in a friend of mine, neighbor, yard, jacked up, and he and I was up under the truck changing the brakes. And, and my phone, my cell phone rang. I got it laying on the ground, you know, while we were up under the car. And it was uh, Ricky Jackson. And uh, he said, hey, hey, brother, you know. And I got real happy, you know, just to hear him, his voice on the phone. I didn't talk to him, you know, on the phone like that. And I said, oh, man, Jack, you know. And uh, and so he started crying instantly. He said, it's over. It's over. He said, I'm, I'm coming home. Mm. And uh, that still, still does something to me. 
he said, I'm coming home. And, and, and we, uh, almost dropped the car on me. You know, I got so excited when he said that. <laughs> uh, I slid out from up under the car. I said, what, what are you talking about? You know, and he said, they let, they let me go, man. He said, man, praise God, they let me go. He said, buddy in court now. And so by the time I got downtown, they were both free. They had been called back to, uh, mm, they'd been called back and exonerated. And that probably was the greatest day of my life to see them come out 39 years of their lives incarcerated. 28 for me. But it would take 11 more to get them out. And that did something to me. Something that I can't explain, but it was, it was glorious. Thank you for sharing that with us. It's impossible not to be moved by stories like Kwame's. But I think it's also really important to say that not all prisoners on death row come in such compelling packages. Not everybody presents as somebody so emotionally available and so um, com compelling. So can you tell us a bit about what it is that first attracted you to this work and gave you what I would describe as such a calling? Because nobody does this for this length of time unless it is a calling. It's not easy work. It's often not obvious how it, how rewarding it will be. Uh, you really are campaigners who keep going, no matter how hard it is. So, Saul, tell me about the early days of the Death Penalty Project. Thanks very much, Afua. Um, well, the early days started um, before me and Pervez, well, just about after we were born, actually. <laughs> and the early days started with a, a small London law firm called Simons Muirhead Burton. And we're really pleased and privileged that Dennis Muirhead, who was the founder of the firm, is with us today. And Dennis um, started this whole operation um, mm. nearly 50 years ago. And it was a, a very um, difficult case called Michael De Freitas, otherwise known as Michael X, um, who's a very political individual um, in the UK and also in the Caribbean. Uh, Michael was charged with murder and faced um, execution in Trinidad. And Dennis took on his case back in 1975, um, or maybe even be a little bit before that. And um, Dennis ran a series of appeals um, before the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council in London, which was and still is the final court of appeal for Trinidad. And tragically, Michael, um, despite serious concerns about his innocence was executed in 1975. So the firm got a taste of hardcore death penalty work um, all those years ago, and it stuck with them um, up until today. And myself and Pervez, we joined the firm in the early 1990s. And the firm was committed, um, sort of as part of their fabric, um, the reason they went to work, that the firm should provide access to justice to the most disadvantaged um, and most susceptible people within a criminal justice system. And those are people who face a death penalty. And um, we were employed oddly by the firm to carry on um, that legacy. And um, we're really proud that we've carried it on up until today. Um, we've sort of taken it around the world. Um, but and we'll, we really come, built and we'll come to that. Um, but yeah. Pervez, how did you go from <clears throat> doing what I think everyone recognizes lawyers do, representing individual clients to actually creating the death penalty project and it is a project and organization that has a legacy that's now bigger than the combined work of both of you uh thanks Afua. yeah I, I mean I, I you're absolutely right we started in the beginning really just a department in the law firm you know just being lawyers representing individuals and really i think you know that that's always been the bread and butter but we were essentially firefighting because in those days um, you would find out about somebody about to be executed, they may be three or four days before their execution, and you'd have to try and do something about it. So as lawyers, it was about trying to see how we could tr try to save that person or at least extend some time so we could look at the case. Uh, but then we realized that as we were doing this over the years and over the decades, we started working in more and more jurisdictions. We started being asked to get involved in more and more cases. And that's really why the Death Penalty Project really 
became sort of, as you say, a project, an organization of its own right um, in, in around 2005, because A, the demand was so high. Um, it wasn't just doing cases to the Privy Council in London, which is the final court of appeal for many jurisdictions, but also we we're being asked by lawyers in, in Africa, in Asia, um, whether we could help them on their death penalty cases. So we realized we really needed to think a little bit bigger. The picture was, was much larger. And that's when the death penalty project really came in, in, into being. But it was also the second side, the sort of the other side of it was we also had to work out how we were going to exist and survive because at the time that we started, we were, as I said, just a department doing cases. And it required the firm and people like Dennis to really support that work that we were doing. But as we were working across the world, when you're doing work for free, and, that, and every case we did was totally for free, and everybody involved, including barristers like Afro and others, they all did work for free. Suddenly we had to pay for, you know, to continue and to exist. And so really the other need was really to establish an organization of international reputation that would allow us to seek funding from governments, institutions, foundations, and so on. So it really, it organically developed, but it, it really, you know, it met two basic requirements. As you both alluded to, you are so global now, working in so many jurisdictions on so many continents. So can you tell me a bit about the scope, the global scope of that work and where you feel you've made the most impacts? And I mean, that's a very unfair question to ask you with a couple of minutes to answer it about a decades long track record. But just give us a sense of the geographical diversity of this work and, and the kinds of impact you've made. Okay, that is a really unfair question. Yeah, but I, I mean, I, I think I'll just narrow it down to, to the human beings that we assist and, and just try to focus on that. And um, we don't choose our clients. Um, we've never done that. They choose us. So we've never said no to a case up until today in 30 years. Um, and the tragedy of our work really is the, the type of people that we end up finding on death row once we go out and we see people. These are the most vulnerable, marginalized people you can imagine whether it's to do with their mental state, um, gender issues, domestic violence issues, in some cases juveniles, um, poverty um, is um, uniform across all of our work. So um, we really find people that have been abandoned, literally abandoned by society on death rows around the world. And I think um, for us, Pervez is going to talk about some of the big impact work, but for us the big impact work is saving human beings. And um, I'll just mention very quickly two cases just to give you a flavor, there are just so many to talk about, but there are two that stick. Um, one is a case of Sheldon Isaac, and these were four guys who were going to be executed in St. Kitts, a small island in the Caribbean. And we got on a plane, went to see them to sort of get on their case. And Sheldon was carried in by two of his um, co appellants, co defendants. And it transpired that he had serious brain injury. He'd been shot um, after the incident had taken place and he was unable to form a sentence. Um, and the most shocking thing about that case was how did the police, the trial judge, his lawyers, the prosecutors, the court of appeal, never think for one second that this guy just was unfit to stand trial. And he was acquitted just to, due to the severity of his, his, his mental state. And the other case is a more recent case from Sierra Leone, a woman called Betty, and I won't use her real name. And Betty was, um, in 2017, she was chased by a group of men. She was carrying her baby on her back and she was chased by a group of men. And as she ran away, she fell. And unbeknown to her, her baby fell out and tragically her nine month old daughter died. Um, she only found this out after she'd been arrested and taken to a police station where she was interviewed in a language that she um, didn't understand. She was forced to put her thumbprint to a confession statement written in English, another language that she didn't understand. She met her lawyer on the first day of her trial. That lawyer dropped out. She had a lawyer on the second day of her trial, and she was sentenced to hang in Sierra Leone. And um, we took on her case, and thankfully in 2000, she got a full pardon. But the, the, the legacy of that case is the stigma, the trauma uh, for her is that she's never seen her community or her other children since. So there's a huge job for her simply to be reintegrated back into her life. Um, so they're just two examples. There are too many to talk about, really. And I do recommend everyone to go onto the Death Penalty Project website because there are a number of cases that are and stories that are told there, and and they they're all um, very moving and but important to read. 
Pervez, I just want to move away from the individual appellants, which are the core and I know the heart and soul of your work and what drives you, but you do also work on reforming the death penalty, reforming criminal laws, creating yeah. constitutional change. Can you tell us about that kind of structural work yeah. that you do? Yeah, I think, I think that's a really important core element of the work. You're absolutely right. The bread and butter, as I said, is representing individuals. It's about saving lives. But in doing that, what we have seen and what, what has been um, produced in terms of evidence across the world is that systemically, a lot of criminal justice systems are phrase many people use are broken. You know, they just don't work. They're not fit for purpose. So an important feature of the work that we've really been trying to do is to strategize and strategically think both legally, politically, how we can try and improve those systems. That is not to try and improve the death penalty. So to make the death penalty work is to try to highlight through the cases that we've done, what systemic problems exist and what needs to happen. So what we've really tried to do is try to, as you say, bring what we would call constitutional litigation, you know, sort of public interest litigation to try to highlight some of the problems and try to bring reform. Um, and that reform has come in a number of ways. So for example, it is dealt with pre-conviction issues. So for example, in many jurisdictions, if you're convicted of a capital offense, you can be automatically sentenced to death. So there's no opportunity for any other sentence. It's an automatic death penalty. We have managed through sort of 15, 20 years of litigation to now establish in over half a dozen countries that have had, have this law um, to create what we call discretion in the sentencing system. So now if you're convicted, the judge or the jury, we say the judge should be the appropriate um, uh, mechanism, can decide what is the appropriate sentence. And that has a huge impact because when you start looking at the sentencing phase of any trial, what comes in then are the human, the human stories, the personal stories, what went wrong, what happened in childhood and so on. And we found that in very, very few cases um, do judges or even juries actually think the death penalty is appropriate. So we managed to reduce the number of people on death row. And that's really, really important for creating the future. And we will come, I'm sure we'll come to that. Um, other issues we've looked at are things like people who have been on death row for many, many years. You guys might know it as the death row phenomenon. Um, we've managed to establish rulings that say that if you've been on death row for more than five years, you should be commuted. We've had looked at clemency provisions where in the past, when they used to decide on applying mercy or clemency, nobody would know when they were meeting, what they were looking at and how they were making decisions. We've now established protocols and laws that say any prisoner, any defendant must be shown what they're looking at, must have an opportunity to make representations and must be given reasons for decisions. So all of these things have what we call, they've limited the scope and application of the use of the death penalty. And that's really, really important. Otherwise, what you find is we're constantly just firefighting each individual case. And that doesn't bring change. It brings obviously important changes in an individual case. But as lawyers, we have to strategize and think the bigger picture. And that, I think, really has been a really impactful part of the work that we've done. And I think we're kind of we're responsible in doing that. If all we did was represent people, individuals, and do singular cases, then I think we're really failing in what we're trying to do, which is bring that movement away from um, using the death penalty. So tell us a bit more about the future and what the strategic priorities are going forward. You've been so successful at this, and I know you're never complacent that there's still so much to do, but what are your main priorities for the work ahead? Well, I mean, it's, it's interesting because if you if you look globally at the death penalty, and it's a really difficult thing to measure, so you have to sort of do it over decades. But if you look at um, what was going on with capital punishment when we first started, or towards the late 1980s, um, the vast majority of the world were executors. 62% um, of the world were active, actively executing. Today, um, it's changed totally. Today, 75% of the world have abolished the death penalty. Um, so the dynamics change, the pictures change, you know, we're kind of winning, we're on the front foot. In the past, we were the kind of, um, we were losing, um, we were on the wrong side um, of the fight, but now we're definitely winning that fight. So I think going ahead, it's really to identify those countries that are lazy, that have the death penalty, have it on the statute books, don't necessarily use it, but there's no impetus to abolish. Um, so we need to push that onto the agenda somehow. And then there are the hard nuts to crack, the, the actively retentionist countries, which are very, very few. So last year, I think only 18 countries globally carried out judicial executions. Um, so there's not many um, countries who are really using the death penalty persistently. So there's a different focus. So, you know, we have to 
um, different strategies, horses for courses, <laughs> basically. And Pavez, how do we get abolition on the political agenda? Because keeping that conversation alive is so important for creating more of the change you've spoken about. And it is cultural and political change that, that really needs this to be reformed. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I completely agree. I think it it is one of the most difficult areas because it's so, you know, the death penalty is such a political issue. Um, and, you know, one of the one of the sort of organic developments in our work, as we as we mentioned at the beginning, is we've gone from an organization department that represented individuals to trying to do a little bit more. And one area in which over the last 15 years we've really focused is trying to look at issues around the death penalty or topics around the death penalty, what were often described as obstacles to abolition, you know, public opinion, deterrence, crime rates, all of these things. And in order to have that discussion, what we've always said is you can't have that discussion in a vacuum. It's got to be led with good, robust empirical research. So if you're going to say, if a government is going to say we must have the death penalty in, in a country because it keeps crime rates low, there needs to be evidence. You can't just say that. You, I've worked in jurisdictions where um, I'm, I'm constantly told by government that um, 50 people die a day from drug use and that's why we must have the death penalty for drugs. These statistics are just put out there without any real research having been done. So what we've really tried to do is we've looked at a number of these issues, as I said, like public opinion, like deterrence, like alternatives to the death penalty. So if you have conversations with governments and executives and they say, okay, you want to abolish the death penalty, what do you replace it with? We have to have an answer. So that's been a real important focus um, on our work. And it, it's a little bit like COGX, in a sense, it's about leadership and talking about leadership. And so for us, we are trying to persuade governments that either want to abolish or want to move away, or even those that don't want to move away to consider moving away, because, you know, they need to look at the death penalty as a human rights issue. If you look at it as just a criminal justice issue or a sanction, then you're not having the right discussion. You need to look at it as a human rights issue. It's also, I think, um, trying to get countries to understand that it, it's a marker for where you are as a country, I think, in the same way that nobody would ever now say, say slavery is acceptable. There will come a time where people will be shocked that countries use capital punishment as criminal sanction. So it's trying to get countries to move in that direction. And we do that by using the cases that we you know, have been involved in. We use that by utilizing the research that we've been involved in. So we commission academics to do empirical research on this and we try to deploy that in the conversation so it's not done in a vacuum we try and fill that space that doesn't um doesn't at this moment in time um is not is not filled and what what we really need to do is we need to get governments and leaders to understand that they need to take political control they need to exercise leadership and it's not about the public leading it's about the public being informed and political um leaders leading and i think that's the real real task and you know i one of the things I always say, so I obviously think this is a, a good line, so because I always repeat it, but I always say in the conversations that I have is that we mustn't get confused by what we're talking about. When we talk about abolition of capital punishment or abolition of the death penalty, we're not talking about abolition of punishment. People should be punished. There should be laws. There is a rule of law. There are, um, there are things that are acceptable, things that are not. So people should be punished for crimes they commit. The question is, is the death penalty an appropriate punishment? Is it proportionate? And is it really necessary to do all the things that you're trying to do as a government? So I think trying to get the, the issue of capital punishment on the political agenda, trying to get people to talk about it is the first step. And then trying to get them to take that next step, which is a brave step, but also it can lead to so many more positive things. And what we've seen is that, you know, around the world, it governments that have abolished the death penalty, they very rarely go back. So, you know, just evidence shows you that once you've gone in that direction, nobody then really says, actually, it was a mistake. We must reverse that decision. So it's getting countries to think like that, really. I'm going to uh, give you all the opportunity and those also watching on Hop In to ask questions, but it feels appropriate to end this part of the conversation as we've begun it, hearing from Kwame. So here is a, a, a little closing video from him. So many different ways in which you can tackle um, 
You can be like Witness to Innocence, Feet on the Ground. You could be like the Death Penalty Project where, you know, we fight so very hard to get these words out like I'm doing now, making this video to send to hopefully uh, new minds and hearts and, and have a better existence with uh, how we go about uh, destroying this evil monster called Capital Punishment. I would say to all of my new friends and supporters, Anybody who's listening to this tape or another tape, be serious. Please be serious and stand alongside of us. There are some of us who have suffered tremendously and continue to suffer with the post-traumatic stress. There's some of us who have lost our lives. There's some of us who have taken our lives. There are some of us who are gone, who have been murdered by the state, but we're innocent. I wholeheartedly appreciate being able to give you this message. Until one fine tomorrow, be kind to someone today. You'd never ever ask the people you represent to pay for their representation. So donations, other ways of supporting through financial support and services are absolutely crucial to keep this work going. So please find a way to support this project if you believe in its work, which I hope you will do. Um, and on that note, uh, would anyone like to ask a question? And I have some popping up here as well. But yes, please go ahead. Well, there, there, there are two countries that, I mean, there, there could be many answers to that question, but I mean, there are two countries where we're focusing on at the moment. One is Sierra Leone, so I mentioned the case of Betty. So Sierra Leone's changing very quickly, and there we have what Pervez was saying, we have seen the political leadership. The president has come forward and said we must abolish the death penalty, it's a violation of human rights. And cabinet have recently approved the bill um, to abolish the death penalty. So we see Sierra Leone um, very close to abolition. Um, and we hope that that will have a knock-on effect in countries like Ghana and West Africa. So there is this domino effect, because I think abolition now, the message is a positive message. Um, there's nothing negative about getting rid of the death penalty. It sends a very strong signal um, that you do respect human rights. So I think that's one country. I think the other region where we've been working from the beginning, and Dennis was working, is the Caribbean. Um, all of the English-speaking Caribbean countries are heavily retentionist. Um, they don't execute at the moment, but they, they all retain the death penalty. There's very little political traction. Um, but in Guyana today, um, the one of the courts, the Court of Appeal, are hearing a challenge to the death penalty, to the lawfulness of the death penalty itself. And if a case like that was to succeed, that would have a knock-on effect judicially um, throughout that region. And I think if one country moved away, you could quite quickly see all the other countries following suit. So... I think you're right in, in the substance of the question that there is a sort of domino effect to abolition. Uh, yeah, I mean, I tell you, just to add to that, it, you know, we, we often sit down, look at the map of the world of the countries that still have the death penalty and try to work out who may be next. And there's no, the, you know, there are different ways in which abolition can happen. It can happen through the courts. Rarely, South Africa is an example, but it's normally politically led, you know, parliament and, and leadership. Um, I think for us, as a you know, as a sort of region, Africa is probably the most proactive in terms of number of countries that are either abolishing or not actually carrying out execution. So another country working, Kenya, for example, hasn't executed for th over 35 years, um, 33 years, and um, you know, so the next it's easier to get to the next step. At the same time, given what Saul has said about that rapid progress, the kind of countries that are left to are some of those hard nuts to crack. That he, he mentioned, I think, I, I think on a political sort of level, the U.S. abolishing the death penalty would be a you know very positive sign because often in the countries that we work in, the first question they say is, "Why are you coming to speak to us about abolition? The U.S. has the death penalty. Why are you not speaking to them? We are. 
but it's a different conversation. But they do use that as a, you know, the, the sort of the greatest democracy in the world, so to speak, and all that stuff. So I think there are certain countries that might have big impact, um, but you, it's quite hard um, to pick where that might happen. One professor that we have done a lot of work with, Professor William Shabus, um, well, he's a professor of international law, very respected on the death penalty. He had a philosophy that if you looked over the years, every year, about three, three countries would abolish. So if you carried on that, by 2025, I think was the bet that we had with him, majority of the world would be abolitionist. I think he's gonna lose that bet, but you know it is going in that direction. It's just that you can't predict how many and how fast each year. There is a big British role in the story, isn't it? Because you know, you're talking about the Caribbean, it's, it's the, the death penalties that currently sits on the statute books was a, a, a British colonial import that's subsequently been kind of culturally internalized by countries who have it, who now defend it as if it's their own culture. But do you feel, is it a strange position to be British lawyers going, trying to undo something that was brought in by the British, but which I'm sure many people sometimes accuse you of imposing Western or Eurocentric values on them in trying to abolish it. Less, less now than before, but um, I, mean, I mean, we definitely, um, a part of our job is tragically undoing the colonial legacy. Um, the death penalty around the Commonwealth um, was a colonial death penalty, a mandatory death penalty by hanging, um, was bequeathed to all the British colonies and on independence, um, they all kept it. Um, and some countries have perpetuated it. Um, so it is, there's a lot of contradictions, a lot of irony um, in what's going on. And you'd like to think that countries now, Guyana recently passed 50 years of independence. Why are you still using a, a colonial punishment that was used to oppress the people of Guyana during the colonial era? It makes absolutely no sense. But as Pepe said, it's so political, the death penalty. If the politicians think there's gain, political gain to be had by keeping the death penalty, then they'll do it. Then, you know, in spite of the history and, and, and the wrong. So, um, yeah, it's, it's all rather tragic, really. Um, but the history is critically important um, and tells a, a sorry tale. Are there any more questions before I... Oh, I'm sorry, I couldn't, I couldn't see you over there. Um, I'll come to you, gentlemen at the back first, yeah. Um, are they all public sovereign state executions or are there private executions that you deal with? Public, as in state executions. Yeah, thank you, and yes. It, I mean, that, that is a question we all ask ourselves, and you're absolutely right. It, it's, I mean, there are, there are a couple of answers to that. I mean, one is that it already exists, and politicians use it, and you'll see this in, you'll see this in the media, you'll see this in news as a tragic a killing. Somebody has been convicted and sentenced to death. Front page of a local newspaper says, man, for, for, for argument's sake, convicted, sentenced to death, sent to the gallows. And in that country, so Kenya, for example, it's, it's unlikely he, he will be executed uh, because everybody else for the last 35 years hasn't or whatever jurisdiction we're talking about. So you're absolutely right. So the question is, what is the point of it? And I think the point of it is this, which is politically, politicians like to say, look, we're tough on crime. If you commit this crime, this is what will happen to you, even though they actually won't be executed. I think the population gets some kind of satisfaction sometimes. I wonder, I, I do think they might do in the sense that they see it in the newspapers and they think that person is going to be executed because one of the things that we've noticed in the research that we've done is that the public generally don't have the knowledge and the information to know what's happening. You know, So they see somebody sentenced to death, but they don't think about, is that person actually going to be executed? Does it happen? When was the last execution? So the level of knowledge and interest, in fact, 
they're not interested. They're more interested in how they're going to educate their children, how they're going to feed their families, how they're going to get on with their everyday lives. So, so a lot of it is just it's happened. It's just it's there and it continues to be there. There is also um, one um, thought as well, which is it's used as a it's used as a tool. You know, it's used as a convenient tool, and it's there, and it can be um, um, executions can resume whenever they want it to happen. So, if there was, for example, political um, reason to start executing, they may start bringing in um, resuming execution. So, it's it's and hard got, to have. You've got examples of countries, haven't you, where they haven't executed for a long yeah. time, and then suddenly they will decide to execute yeah. a specific India, prisoner. Yeah, Pakistan, Chad. Uh, so you don't get as a death row prisoner ever the complacency that you can relax and know at least you'll never be executed. You Absolutely live in the constant not. terror that it could happen Absolutely, at any yeah. minute. And there is the psychological harm, as you say, of somebody being sentenced to death. Somebody sentenced to death is treated differently in the prison to other prisoners. The, the regime for prisoners on the sentence to death is different. You know, it's much harsher. It's because they're about to be executed. So they don't have access to X and Y. They don't have facilities that you can use because in, the, in, you know, in earlier days, executions were swift. Once you're sentenced to death, you're executed. So what happens is, and this is a death row phenomenon, you're, you're left languishing on death row, not knowing, and but being told you're on death row. We've had cases where prisoners have told us when we've met with them that the, um, the execution chamber is being tested from time to time just to scare the prisoners that they may be next. You know, it's, um, it, it's really, really difficult. I, we also know of one conversation that we heard of, of um, cabinet before an election asking whether there was anybody they could execute because it may win more votes and you cannot control that and that's that's where I think the political dynamism or the lack of dynamism is is something that really needs to be tackled. I'm afraid we're out of time it's gone so fast but um it's been a really illuminating conversation. You somehow managed to race through 30 years of work and a huge global task that still needs to be done in a really short period of time. So thank you both so much. Thank you to the audience. You've been a great audience and I hope you enjoyed, enjoyed and learned and feel inspired to somehow get involved in this work yourself. So thank you so much.